Well, that essay kind of uses Scheherazade and the story of the woman who, the king, who kills a woman every night. He weds a woman and kills her every night. And then his vizier's daughter is chosen to be his newest bride. And she knows that to survive, she has to keep him from killing her. So every night she tells him a story that's so good that he wants to keep her alive for another night to tell a story. And for a long time, you know, I've taught young women um, writing. I've taught, you know, writing, creative writing workshops for young women. And the story had always been a way of me kind of entering into a more dynamic um, way of getting them to tell the stories that they actually care about. Saying storytelling is is an emergency. It's not like a cute thing. It's not like you want to write a story that's going to make you famous. You want to tell the story that's going to keep you alive. Like Scheherazade, her stories are these adrenaline fueled attempts to actually save her life. And so as we tell stories, we should ask ourselves, what are the stories that will keep me alive? Because if they keep me alive, they may keep other people alive. But then I was thinking about storytelling, as I often do, as being a non-human event, as being something that we belong to, but we didn't, we didn't invent. And I was thinking about the earth itself, you know, Gaia, the great mother, whatever you, the biosphere, you know, as being a kind of Scheherazadean character that is telling these stories with um, hurricanes, with heat waves, with forest fires to try and get our attention, to stay alive say, come on, pay attention. Um, And I think that's the interesting thing is we are so culturally shut down to our sensory experience that I feel like we've been sensorially receiving climate information for a long time. Like you mentioned smell. And I was thinking like, I think that things have probably smelled wrong for a long time, but it's things are just loud enough now that in our very shuttered, very simplistic um, existence, we're finally paying attention. Mm-hmm. But the stories have to get loud. Yeah, that seems to be the... That, that was This was something that was touched on with, with Dare in that uh, yeah. conversation you had with them. Yeah. Um, that our culture, if you want to call it that, or civilization yeah. or whatever it is, um, really shutters off our s- senses and our ability to, yeah, sense things. I mean, with all the senses we have. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, it's I like think you, people yeah. are so attracted to these big heroic psychedelic experiences. They just want to turn on their senses. <laughs> and yeah, okay, a psychedelic experience will wake up those senses, but you also have that available to you every single day. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, uh, <laughs> I've, I've talked about psychedelics. Uh, yeah. I've kind of backed off a bit just because I haven't had many lately yeah. in my life, but yeah. I think it was one of those things where when I, when I had that first mushroom experiences, mostly, yeah. um, they, yeah, the senses that I, my, my sense of smell, taste, and the, not just them as distinct separate categories of senses, but they were blending together in such a particular way. And it was overwhelming because I was realizing in that experience, like I had access, I felt like on some level I had access to this the entire time, but I, whether consciously or not, didn't want to have that intensity of, of felt experience because it was it was too much to like live in this place and in this time and in the, with my body and this, like it was too much to take in all the time because it was, um, hard. (laughs) It was hard. And I also think that sensory gating is a survival technique. Like you want to be able to hear your name called in a room of people talking. So you have to be able to gate out all the other noise to distinguish your name. You know, you want to be able to see an animal coming at you through the woods. So you have to be able to block out all the other visual stimuli. So you see that perturbation, that movement. Um, So I think that gating is actually something that is helpful. The problem is that I think think the way we used to homogenize our, our 
the kind of sensory stimuli we register um, had a lot more to do with an understanding of how land worked and how weather worked. But now it, it has to do with abstractions and mm. with, uh, with structures that are totally man-made and have nothing to do with our actual somatic survival. So I think that's the really hard thing is we do need to gate out, you know, to, to let in all the stimulus is to be totally overwhelmed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But how do we begin to play with that doorway, opening it a little bit, letting in a little bit more, closing it? Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, in your writing, you talk a great deal about mycelium. Yeah. You talk about, and you use that as, a, as not only, it's more than just a metaphor for you. I think that it actually is, there's a sensory or. Um... It's a, it's a lyrical ideogram. It's like a, it's like the way, it's the, the thing that arrived to me that helped my brain work. I don't even mean it as like a substance I took. I mean, like it was a way of thinking. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we all have our, our cognitive companions that come and help us think. Yeah. How did that come to you? Um, I think I loved, loved mushrooms when I was little. I mean, I grew up in the Hudson Valley and I was like down on the ground and like looking at things and like pulling up like roots and looking at little dangly mycelium. Not that I knew that what that was at that point. But for me, it was really this aha moment of realizing it was in college where I was fascinated with mycorrhizal networks and there wasn't that much information about them yet. Um, and I had read Deleuze and Guattari and found it to be like really, really interesting and dry and like not rooted in ecology. And I was trying to find some way to think about rhizomes in a much more ecologically, scientifically interesting way and doing this research. And as that was happening, as my love of mycology and fungi was deepening into this mycorrhizal um, area of study, I got diagnosed finally. I'd been mysteriously ill for a really long time. Um, mm -hmm. with a connective tissue disease. And so it was this very kind of vertiginous, weird moment where I was like fascinated with co the connective tissue of the soil and realizing that all of my health issues were connective tissue issues. Um, mm -hmm. So it was like a moment where I realized that this was like pl had been planted in my body genetically, like since birth. So yeah, I mean, and that's my interpretation, but it def definitely felt like I had grown into my purpose. I had found the being that I was wedded to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, uh, I, I feel like, um, I'm trying to figure out how to ask this question or yeah. say this, but my experience with mushrooms, mm -hmm. uh, we, we were just touching on psychedelics, yeah. but the experiences that I've had with them, has always felt like there it was an actual intelligent being or not even a being. It felt like a collection of beings. Yeah. And it was showing me things and it was tell it was actually speaking to me almost in this hive mind thing. It was very and, and it was mischievous, but also it, it contained multitudes, I guess. Yeah. It feels very yeah. like it feels chattering. It feels like yeah. it has a lot yeah. to say. And it's bumptious yeah. and kind of unruly, um, puckish. You know, I always think of the the, fer the fermented gods, like very Dionysian. Um, yeah, I've had that experience too, and I've done mushrooms. Um, uh, for me, the big experience, the big paradigm shift was about time. When I, when I had psilocybin experience, I I experienced time as um, flowing backwards. Um, and mm. as feeling my future flowing back into me and feeling moments begin to recursively spiral. Um, yeah. So it was, a, it was a real, um, it troubled my idea of the arrow of time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it seems like the, yeah, mushrooms, when they do that, it seems like it does disrupt your percept not only your perception of time but the way it flows yeah and that seems like a common thing and i think there's a lesson in that right well yeah i mean quantum physics and you know libet's delay all there's a lot of there's a lot of 
pretty mainstream science out there that says we don't really understand how time works. Is it this kind of a Minkowski like cube? Like, are we just like a snake that exists along our whole timeline and we're experiencing this one moment, but we really exist along our whole life? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there are lots of interesting questions about that, especially about readiness potential. Um, do you know about this? Mm-mm. You know, they, they, yeah. they've done these studies, um, lipid studies are the most famous ones. I think those were in the 80s, where they would show that people would make decisions, but their bodies were registering them and preparing them before they cognitively made the decision. Mm-hmm. And, um, and also that you can shock someone and they'll be preparing for it in their body before they receive the shock without knowing that they're going to receive it. So they're all these strange temporal kind of... Um, glitches in scientific studies that trouble our ideas of, of free will, of causality. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you think that when we're talking about, um, I think you said sense gating. Yeah. Sensory what? gating. Yeah. Sensory gating. Yeah. That part of our sensory, uh, apparatus or our ability to, to anticipate things on that sort of that 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 way you've described time itself yeah. that that like taking a psychedelic experience which just feels like a door gets flung open right yeah. um that our I'm kind of feeling this out right now yeah go for it it's, <laughs> that by doing that by having that that experience you described with time um that that is a part of our I'm going to use the word, say sensory apparatus, but our ability to anticipate something that's like pulling us towards it. We may not know what that thing is, but we know that we are about to do it or it is about to be done to us. Yeah. I mean, I you would know what say I mean? Like, there's, have you read anything by Eric Wargo? I haven't. Okay. Really, really fun. Or listen to his interview with Michael Garfield on um, future fossils, like whatever. He's an amazing He's an amazing, like, amateur. Um, he he's he's a hobbyist. He loves science. He loves quantum physics. He he acknowledges that this is like not his area of expertise, and yet he still writes about it in a very interesting, compelling way. And mm-hmm. he's interested in the fact that pretty much all cultures, up until very recently, believed in some form of precognition and precognitive dreams and and prophecy. And that if we actually look at, at how dreams work, I mean. Freud, this this is fascinating. Freud had to work really hard to disprove how many prophetic dreams he was having and his patients were having. And if you actually look at them on paper all together, you're like, whoa, that's a lot. Like you have to really work hard at a certain point to say what's going on here. Um, mm-hmm. And I think in our own lives, we we can look back at our biographies and see that we've been kind of primed and made ready for certain events in ways that we couldn't know about as they were happening. But if we look backwards, we see that we were kind of the guardian angel angel of our own self. We were like positioning ourselves perfectly. Mm. Yeah. I think a lot of us have had similar experiences that are like that. I wonder what that means on a collective level. You know, yeah. we we're discussing climate and, you know, that it's like really loud now. It's just like everything's happening. And I feel like everything that's been happening uh, for the past few years, at least, because I think we've been, uh, you know, in our bones, we've known that this was going to happen. Yeah. And uh, in a way, like my friend, uh, we were talking about this. He describes like the sort of mass psychosis that we're experiencing yeah. seemingly. Um is because of this deep denial of something that we've already been sensing that the earth is changing and it's, we know the, we know the reasons. Yeah. And, uh, and it's affecting us on a behavioral level. Uh, and we, and we're seeing the results of that now, you know? Well, I think that the culture has been gaslighting the people who felt this on a very bodily, very real level, you know, climate, you know, one of my close family friends is a climate journalist. And for about 15 years, he's been talking about this. And he said to me, I remember like five years ago, he was like, the apocalypse is happening already. 
It just hasn't mm-hmm. drifted upwards. It's affecting all it, all of the, the South. It's affecting the yeah. minorities. It's affecting the poorest populations, the third world countries. It just hasn't quite reached us yet. But it's mm-hmm. not like going to happen. It has happened. Um, right. And I think this past year has really been that, you know, the wave has finally reached us. Um, mm-hmm. It's here. It was already happening, but now, now we're feeling the effects. Yeah. Yeah, it's like all this... Um, I think that's the thing. I don't know if there's, it's not justice or retro. I don't know what it is. It's none of those words, but it's that thing of, um, you know, there's no place to go in this. There's no way to escape it. There's always been, I think within the way things have played out over hundreds of years through colonization and global capitalism and the hierarchies that are imposed because of that. And you could go through all of that, that to a certain degree, those of us in the global North and particularly those that have benefited under sort of a patriarchal form have been able to buffer themselves on some level from the impacts of that, uh, that hierarchy, you know, on, on people that have been kind of exploited under that, right? We can buffer ourselves from the effects of that, but this is one of those things where I, I don't see how, uh, you know, it, it really is bubbling up to the top. Yeah. And affecting I mean, those that have, yeah. Something that's been talked about for a couple of years in chronic and terminal illness groups that I've participated in has been that, you know, more and more young people are very seriously ill. And I think that there mm-hmm. has been an experience that like, people who have disability and chronic illness have felt this beforehand. They have felt that precognitive pulse in their own bodies. And I do think that there are people who are kind of the canaries in the coal mine who feel these things, um, beforehand. Um, Mm -hmm. and I, yeah, I have, I have noticed that there have been, um, I felt more seen ecologically and, and more believed about climate change, when I was in groups of people who were the survivors of abuse and trauma and seriously ill. It was an interesting thing, Mm -hmm. phenomenon that those were the people they felt it in their bodies before other people did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, has your, uh, the condition that you have, has that allowed you to, do you feel like you yourself feel like a canary in the coal mine on a certain level? Like, that you're able to perceive and ex- feel things or experience things in a way that others maybe can conveniently ignore. Uh, do you feel that way about yourself at least? And I, yeah, I think people, I think whenever you have a, a non normative physical experience, you can either frame it as being a symptom or as a superpower. And it really depends on how you um, want to narrativize it. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that my body is extraordinarily sensitive to chemicals and to toxins and to foods and to stimuli, um, in a way that is often like very, very dramatic. So Mm -hmm. that can be scary and intense and could limit my life if I wanted it to, but it's also a way of thinking about my body as being kind of like an alarm signal. Like, yeah. Yeah. like I'm like the fire alarm <laughs> in the house where there's a gas leak and no one else has noticed it yet, but I'm going off. Um, mm-hmm. Which is, you know, it's interesting. Yeah. And I, the joke has always been, yeah, I will sense the, I sensed a gas leak in my house before we actually got it noticed and no one else sensed it. So mm-hmm. I'm always sensitive to these small changes in chemicals and um, pesticides and toxins. Yeah. Well, I think that makes sense when I, talking about this because like reading your essays there's a very i mean it's it's like a palpable sensual thing that i feel when i read that um and and you, you write that into whatever it is and it's just it's felt and i think that's part of why i think i mean that's how i became aware of you is because of how I think you, you're becoming incredibly popular as far as people that really appreciate your writings or sharing them, um, which is well-deserved. Um, 
but it, yeah, it's like you've you've taken this thing, and I'm not here to do this thing where it's like you have a you know a disability or or this issue, and you've like you know pulled yourself up by your bootstraps and made yourself this you know I'm not doing that, but I do think that through that way that you're you're living in your body, you've become attuned to something that most people are kind of numb to. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that I've been thinking about is if you're so in your body, like, you know, extreme pain events, extreme, like I've had NDEs, like where I thought I was going to die and everyone else thought I was going to die. And they bring you back into your body actually in such an exquisite, intense way. And you can think about that as being agonizing, but it also makes you available to extreme pleasure. And so what I want to make available to people is, yeah, to embody, to drop back into ourselves right now is to feel the pain, but it it is also to feel the pleasure that we have been denying ourselves for so long. Mm. They both exist simultaneously. We have to be able to hold them both. 